Welcome to Book Me Podcast, sponsored by Nimbus Publishing. I'm Lindsay Glode Rainingbird. Join me as we journey through contemporary Canadian literature, reading as much as we can and chatting with authors, illustrators, and other bookish folk, celebrating our dynamic, diverse, and vibrant national literary scene as we go. So grab a snack, get cozy, break that binding, dog ear those pages, let's dig into it. Today we're chatting with Catherine Alexandra Harvey, author of Quiet Time. It's a darker debut novel about one woman's coming of age amidst addiction, toxic relationships, and mental health issues. Perfect for cooling weather, its unsettling vibes and masterful tension will have you uneasy until the last page. Aptly described as perfect for fans of Heather O'Neill, this is your autumn palette cleanser, a beautifully written book imbued with folklore, legend, and the supernatural from a gifted new novelist you're going to love. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So you're from Newfoundland, right? I am, yeah. And you managed to get here through the hurricanes. <laughs> so were you still in Newfoundland then when it was yeah, hitting? Yeah. And it wasn't so bad. No, 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 it wasn't so bad. The West Coast got hit pretty bad, but the East Coast didn't get hit very much. You're the editor of Relit. The executive director and editor of the the, the magazine, yeah. Tell me a little bit about what that's like in how it might have informed your own book or writing your own book. I was writing this book long before I took on that role. I mean, there's only been one issue and that's, you know, there's a bunch of reasons for that, but mostly it's funding issues. But editing anything will make you a better editor, a better writer. So I think that that's had a, a huge impact on me. And I mean, I read a lot for the relits. I think that any writer should read as much as possible and as widely as possible. So I think it just, it will always make you a better writer. So one of the things I noticed most in your book that I really enjoyed was how everything's written on chronological. All of the different short chapters are mixed in between past, future. And to me as a reader, that made me think of just where her mental state was at the time. Is that kind of what the intention was? Or So when I started writing the book, I... Actually, the first section I wrote was the one when she's, it's right at the beginning of the, the book when she's in the therapist's office. And I was, I was at a place in my life where I was just starting to go to therapy and like realizing all the things that are involved in the mental health system. And so I wrote that section and I had no idea what it was going to be. And then I just kept building on it. And I knew it was really important for me to interweave these things because I firmly believe that your childhood has a huge effect on you shapes you as an adult and I wanted to show how these things end up imprinting on us in in late the later years and I just wanted to keep the reader you know entertained I wanted to keep it moving quickly um I think it's just my style my style of writing like I'm not someone who likes to like go on and on and on and on like I I love that kind of writing and I will read it but I think from my own attention span stylistically it just made sense as I and it was very organic I didn't really plan it it just kind of like it was how I ended up writing it so yeah short punchy chapters and that probably helped with keeping the tension which I found kind of amazing how you kept that tension all the way through <laughs> like I was just like oh my gosh yeah like have a breath at the end hopefully <laughs> yeah I mean definitely don't want to give away the ending but yes you can breathe at the end <laughs> what was your motivation for writing this book tell me a little bit about your process coming up with it um I think it just had to do with the place I was in my life. I was going through a breakup at the time and I felt I needed to get some stuff out. I mean, I've always written when I was little, I would write like little short stories and like put them in duo tangs and like make little covers and stuff. So and I think I wanted to know that I could do it. Like, I think I wanted to know that I could write a write a book. And so it just became kind of like an outlet for me. And I was just right. I was just working through things and um, writing them down. And I would I was working with uh the Heritage Foundation in Newfoundland at the time. And so I would go in like, you know, two hours early in the morning and I would just write. It took about six years from start to finish, but I wasn't working on it the whole time. You know, I'd step away from it for a while because it is, it's a very personal book. And so like I had to work through things myself in order to be able to write, write it. And there were times when it was just, you know, too painful and I had to kind of take a step back. But and and then I had to be able to um, get to a place where I was able to let it all go because that's by my nature, I'm very, very like obsessive. And uh, so it was that was a very difficult process. But I think that 
it was hugely healing in the end. Yeah. So t- talking about that, your main character, Grace, struggles with a lot of issues that might make her unreliable and sometimes unlikable as a narrator. How did you balance that while writing? And do you think that can kind of be a risky narrative choice sometimes? I mean, it's like the quote, like, if you want to make a monster first, you have to make a man. Like, everyone has to have dichotomies because otherwise they're not relatable. And I mean, a lot of things that this Grace character possesses, I was realizing in myself and I had to kind of like accept those things and like be willing to acknowledge that like everyone played a role in it and like she wasn't just a victim and it's it would be just a flat character if there was no, you know, bad stuff and you have to be willing to look at these things and it was important for me to be able to do that. Yeah, and if you don't really know what's going through her mind when she's struggling so much and then the chapters are all over the place, you're just kind of like not really sure what's happening. I really actually enjoyed that. I like not knowing exactly what was happening and if what she was experiencing was the real truth or just what she was perceiving. Mm -hmm. And you also imbued a lot of elements of supernatural and folklore and legend in it, which also helped with that kind of, is this all real? Mm -hmm. Is this all happening kind of feeling? Yeah. Yeah. That I mean, that was a conscious decision. And I did folklore in school. So I know a lot of um, these things. And obviously, if I did it in school, it's of interest to me. So um, one of the very first things I wrote to was like the crow uh, motif. And I was like, I can do something with this. I did want to kind of confuse the reader and make them question her reality. And, you know, is she experiencing these things? Is she, you know, mentally ill, which is obviously very pretty clear she is. But it's also I just thought it was like an interesting metaphor to like the ghosts and stuff. And I mean, I grew up in a in a house that was really old and I had a lot of like supernatural experiences and stuff. So, um, I mean, the little the little girl ghost like was based on something that happened to me when I was a kid. So like it was it just like all all fit and it was interesting. And I, I wanted to like spook people out of bed and, you know, just confuse people (laughs) you did it worked but also both things can be true she can be mentally ill and she can be actually experiencing these things Mm -hmm. my uh, mother-in-law has a childhood story where they grew up in an old house out in I think in Onslow and she told her mother one day why do you always rub our heads and like say goodnight to us and stuff I don't like that can you stop and her mom was just like I don't do that oh my gosh so there's <laughs> that's this, creepy <laughs> so they were like thought there was a woman there who also I guess like played the piano so you could sometimes hear the piano I think how the story goes but wow. yeah spooky <laughs> yeah I would not like that like But you went to school for folklore. Mm -hmm. How did you get into that? Because that's so fascinating. I didn't even know you could get a master's and bachelor in that. That's really interesting. It's um, there's a program in the States and Memorial are like the two kind of like programs that are known, well known. When I applied to school, I had declared my major as political science. I was going to go to law school and I did introduction to folklore and I was like, oh, damn, like this is better. <laughs> this is what I have always been interested in without even knowing what it was. Like I was just I was really into history, but folklore is more so like the common things, like the kind of like undocumented um, word of mouth, oral tradition, all that sort of stuff. And I just like the stories of like everyday people, too, and like the this, this stuff that doesn't seem important, but like is important. So, yeah, I just I did that in school and then went on right through to do my master's and kind of focused on uh, museology. Um, so I worked in a lot of museums and did curation and stuff like that. And then when COVID hit, I <laughs> wrote this. <laughs> well, finished it finally. But yeah, six years working on it. Yeah, yeah. It's your baby there. Yeah, it was a it was a long time for sure. I understand why it would be hard to let go. It's like, at what point after six years is it done? Mm. Did you ever feel like it was actually done? I mean, Whitney was kind of like, you know, uh, she she's very, very good. She's a very good editor, but she's also a very good person. And she was very gentle with me because she knew, one, how personal this book was. And two, like me as a person like she she understood how I operated and stuff and so she was firm but she was gentle so it was good because she didn't rip it out of my hands or anything (laughs) she gave me enough time and but she talked me through like this is normal like you know it's going to be really hard to let it go the perfectionism that I have like I felt like I could just go forever aside from like I've started to do readings now 
I haven't even looked at the book because I know that once I like if I look at it, like I'm going to be like, oh, my God, I should have done this differently. Or I'm a firm believer. And once something's published, don't look at it again. <laughs> well, I looked at it. I read the whole thing. It was great. So you, you can rest easy that you did an amazing job. And you did your book launch yesterday. So how did it go? Yeah, we did. We did a book launch in St. John's um, before I left. And that was good. And then I think yesterday it was very low key because of the hurricane and the Let's state of emergency. Know. Yeah. So like a lot of people I think still don't have power and stuff. So it was very small. Um, but I'm happy with I was happy with the reception in St. John's uh, had a, like quite a few people come out for that. It was really nice, like people in the community. And uh, yeah, so afterwards tonight, I think that's going to be the big the big one. I'm a little nervous about that, but <laughs> it'll be good. Yeah. And have you got much feedback yet? I know it's just early days. Um. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten uh really nice like most all, almost all the feedback I've gotten has been has been nice like the review in the Toronto Star I thought was was great um I was really grateful for that um Quill Inquire has reviewed it um and yeah just like you know people that have on social media that have messaged me and stuff like that um I mean I I understand it's not a book for everyone it's a darker book and um you know not a lot of people want to look at you know these darker things and are not comfortable with it and it, it is disturbing and I, I get that um but I, I just wanted to write a story that showed what people go through and I wanted people to feel less alone and feel seen and um that's kind of what I hope people get from it in the end that they feel you know seen and heard and less alone hopefully <laughs> Right now, you would think that people don't want that many dark stories, but actually you're seeing so many dark stories. There's a lot of really difficult trauma filled books that have come out and done amazingly. So I think people are ready to dig into harder, darker books and are better for it. How did you manage to keep the tension going throughout the entire book? I think keeping sections short is a good way. Keeping them short and on point and kind of like ending on a punch. Um, I think it's really important to, like, when you're writing, like, you have to, you know, end on a cliffhanger. Um, and I think with the, like, the going back and forth between sections, it kind of kept people moving because you're following three different timelines. So you want to know each time it ends, you want to know what happens in the next timeline. So it just keeps you engaged. So that was intentional. But it was never my intention to, like, create a ton of tension I think people will read it it differently and yeah for me it was a little bit of like an emotional thriller almost for sure yeah 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 I get that an element I enjoyed was the letters Grace is writing to someone named Sunshine peppered throughout but you don't find out who she's writing to until the end uh why did you want to include those in the book I always love le like when there's letters in books um and again it was like another timeline that was being followed one of the things with the book was you know, she's trying to find her voice the whole time and she's, you know, being silenced mostly by the patriarchy. But this is her outlet. This is like she's writing down what she really thinks, what she's really feeling all these years that she's not saying anything. In the end, letting them go and stuff, it it was important for kind of like finding that peace and that uh, that proper ending, I suppose. I didn't really know what I was doing with the letters until the end. The ending was something completely different. And then I rewrote it when I uh, sent it off to try and get my agents um, based on kind of like their advice and stuff like that. They thought that the ending wasn't working. So I rewrote this ending and, and it worked well. That's that's what happens with the editing process. You start pulling everything together and you become so Im immersed in it and almost like obsessive and it's almost like a madness or like an illness or something. And you start pulling the little pieces and everything starts to fit. And it's uh, kind of what happened with the letters. Yeah. Well, another mystery in it. I thought it was like three different people when I was reading. Oh, really? <laughs> and then who it actually was. I was like, oh, OK. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about the design process. I heard you had a little bit of input on the cover and everything. So. I had a couple ideas for the cover. Again, I don't know how much how much fun I am to work with because I'm <laughs> very controlling and very obsessive. Um, but I had a few ideas. I had a few um, photographers in mind that I really admire. The photographer that we use, I'm a huge, huge fan of her work. Um, I followed her on Instagram for years and one of her works um, I had initially pitched and 
uh, not everyone could agree on it. So then I found this one and I was like, this, this is it. And said it to Whitney. I was like, this, this feels like it's it. And she was like, this feels like it's it. And everyone on the marketing team loved it. And so, uh, yeah. And then I got a few kind of like, uh, samples of the layout and, and all that. And it, it just came together really well. I had input from start to finish in absolutely every way. And I was really grateful for that. And I'm really, really happy with how it turned out with the mask over her and like the the themes of, you know, like being bound and the mental illness stuff. It just all worked. Yeah, it gives you almost a straight jacket kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the, the beauty, maintaining the beauty, too, which is something that's very important to Grace in the book, like always kind of this facade of like beauty and put togetherness and everything, even though everything's like falling apart. <laughs> this is the one thing I can control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you have a excerpt that you might want to read? Yeah, I'll do a little excerpt here. I have marked this section and I really like it. So I'm going to do this one. This one is about her coke addiction. So uh, it's kind of like the experience of what it's like to be, you know, an addict in a very short section. I just thought it worked. This section works really well. And I thought it was a little kind of like funny, even though it's just probably my dark sense of humor. <laughs> I don't know, but Whitney thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like dark humor. All right. In the beginning, I loved everything about doing coke. I loved when my dealer showed up. I loved the secrecy of slipping bills into his hand and getting that baggie in return. Something I wanted more than anything. My anxiety would dissipate as soon as I wrapped my fingers around that beautiful little baggie. I would head for the nearest bathroom. I didn't care about anything else. I loved crushing it up with the back of my credit card. I loved pouring a pile of that shiny white powder onto the toilet tank and the ritual of cutting up lines, making them perfect. I loved rolling up that bill and devouring the line, snorting it into my nose with one controlled motion. I loved the way it smelled like gasoline and decaying bugs. I loved the way it dripped down the back of my throat, prompting my tongue to tingle and go numb. The first few lines were what I lived for. I'd apply a fresh coat of lipstick, hitch up my skirt a little higher, and undo an extra button on my shirt. When I emerged from the bathroom, I was myself again, confident, sexy, high. It was how I wanted people to see me. It was who I wanted to be. I was quicker with my wit, sharper with my comebacks. Mostly, I loved coke because I knew who I was when I was doing it. I knew everything about that girl. She was sure of herself. Everyone loved her. Men and women wanted her, and she always got what she wanted. But after those first few lines, the want became need. I was no longer in control of myself. I didn't know what I was saying, where I was going. I was shaky, spilling all my secrets, talking simply because it felt good. I just wanted that next bump. It was all that mattered. I had to maintain the feeling. I didn't want it to ever go away. Fiending, wild-eyed, scanning the room. Who has coke? Do you have any coke? Where can I get more coke? I became sloppier. The ritual was no longer important. I just needed it now. I didn't even try to conceal it. Snorting key bumps under my coat, white powder caked to my nose. I didn't care about anything. I just needed it now. I would pace around the room as the sun came up. Some guy passed out nearby. I wanted out of my skin, out of my body, out, out, out. It wasn't fun anymore. This isn't fun anymore. Cutting up lines not because I wanted to, but because I couldn't stop. Self-loathing would come. When the coke ran out, the self-loathing would come. Lying in bed, crying and praying to God to please let me sleep. Please kill me. Please, God, just let me die. Let me die tonight so this will be over. I can't take it anymore. Please let me die, please. That part I didn't love so much. That's so good. <laughs> so, yeah, just a really light, pleasant read, yeah. really. Like, I th- warm, fuzzy feelings. <laughs> of course, yeah. Take it to the beach. <laughs> take it on vacation. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it's so good. Thank you. I always want to know what authors are reading. So what book are you reading right now? I just finished House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. I've been reading a lot of, like, John Cheever. I read Patricia Highsmith's The Price of Salt before that. been reading, like, the Bronte sisters which I do every like over and over. Um, but it's just like incredible every time I read it. The new book I'm writing is set in like the 1930s and 1950s. So I'm trying to get a, f- a better feel for the way people talk and that those kind of uh, things. So writing another book already. Oh, my God. I, I already have a poetry collection done that um, is in the process of being sold now. And I'm wow. writing a, a memoir and uh, another novel and a short story collection. I, I mean, You're I, busy. I, always, <laughs> I always have a bunch of stuff on the go because when one thing like becomes too much, then I can like switch over. And does a poetry collection have a title? It's called Tender Parts. Tender Parts, a poetry collection. Keep your eyes mm-hmm. out for that, too. <laughs> yeah. 
thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Quiet Time by Catherine Alexandra Harvey is available now everywhere books are sold. And thank you for listening and hanging out with us. Join me next time on this book lover's journey as we try to read more, read Canadian, read local. You know, all the good things. <laughs>